Pete and, uh, just mentioned uh, this idea of Joel Spolsky and uh, his idea of leaky abstractions, that every abstraction is leaky to some degree or another. Of course, all web frameworks are an abstraction over something. There's another kind of similarly related law that's much less familiar to most of you unless you just happen to have read one of my books that we call Dijkstra's Law. And let me explain what this is, and then I'm going to ask these guys how their frameworks uh, uh, react to this. Um, so a uh, long time ago, I worked for a consulting company, and we built a lot of Microsoft Access applications. And we eventually stopped doing that because we realized that every Access application started with a really screaming success, and they all ended in total failure. And we wanted to understand why that was, and so we codified this thing called Dietzler's Law, because Terry Dietzler was the guy who was doing all this stuff with Access. And what we realized was, when you're using a framework like Microsoft Access, that 80% of what the user wants is really super fast and easy to achieve. And they're always stunned at how fast you can get it done. The next 10% of what the user wants is possible but difficult because you have to get underneath the framework and kind of bend it or hack it or do something it doesn't really want to do, but you can kind of convince it to do it. But the last 10% that you try to achieve is impossible with that framework, and that is deep source law that users always want 100% of what they want. This is why we don't have fourth generation languages anymore because those abstractions didn't allow you to get underneath them enough to actually build really useful things. And so the question I would pose to our panelists, let each of them uh, respond to this, is how does your framework respond to the kind of dual forces of the leaky abstraction of Spolsky's law and this <laughs> idea of deep source law about having a framework that allows you to get the right level of regularity to be able to build things? Well, at JSF, we try to push it as far with that 80% case by just being really good about listening to what the community says uh, and really knowing what kind of apps our, our framework is well suited to build. So from the beginning, we wanted to focus on corporate developers that were building enterprise intranet apps that were focusing on the needs that they had in their department, and uh, that was the sweet spot. If you wanted to scale it up and build larger, uh, more complex things like you know eBay, we wanted to be able to go there as well, but um, we try to stay in the sweet spot of the corporate developer. Now, when you do get to this 10% where you can't uh, meet the needs using the regular abstractions, because we're based on Java EE, we do have the ability to drop down into the servlet layer, but that's sometimes you get into some more trouble because when you take the reins yourself, you are sometimes fighting with the framework, and that's something that uh, you just kind of have to watch out for. Um, but it requires a more advanced uh, level of skill to do that. But, you know, people can do it with JSF, and they have been doing it for a long time. So I, I think that abstraction is the power in frameworks. Uh, in part, if we have two layers of abstraction <coughs> of HTML5, we, of course, everybody can write things directly on HTML5, but we want to kind of guarantee to you that if you're using body components, they work right. You don't have to kind of think about browser differences. You don't have to think about layouting. You don't have to think about whether there is a proxy that cannot do web sockets in between your browser and, and your server. So if you're writing things on the server side, it's super easy to write with out of those ready-made components. But at the same time, this is a compromise. You are giving up some power on on details, how the communication happened, on how these things are rendered. And if you want to take back that power and that control, then you can drop down one level in abstraction, keep programming in Java, but program on the client side. So we have a compiler that compiles from Java to JavaScript, and it abstracts away from the browser differences. If your IE happens to leak memory, it takes care of that. So you don't have to work directly with the browser, but you have full control over the DOM. So if that's not enough, you can go down one more level and directly manipulate DOM, directly manipulate CSS, and directly deal with all the browser differences and challenges. But then it's up to you. So we have three levels, and I, I think that by having those levels, you get a lot of productivity out of that. So when think think about Angular, I think most of we think about the directives we have. Model. And that is our like the highest level that most people think about. Uh, but what is not maybe widely known is that these directives were written on top of what we call the HTML compiler, which allows you to 
uh, write your own directives. And the directives we ship in Angular are in no way special. We just wanted to make sure that you as a developer could also write them as well. So all the API that are escape, that you need to build complex things like NGPP is actually available to you as a developer as well. So the 80% is using the NGPP. You can drop down on a level lower, layer low, and you can use your uh, use directives to make up new vocabulary for your browser. And if that's not enough, you can certainly go down all the way to HTML, uh, all the way to sorry, the browser. You can just do things the old-fashioned way using jQuery. Um, to really allow you to do stuff in the jQuery world, you really have to make sure the framework is well behaved so it doesn't take over the browser. And that goes kind of the other point is that a good uh, framework is one through which you can slowly ease into rather than one that kind of takes over and says you will do everything uh, our way. Uh, and so we always wanted to make sure that you can, for example, even have two instances <coughs> of Angular on the same page and it will still work. So there's a lot of facets to this particular question, but it has to do with different layering and as well as just playing nice with other objects, not taking over the global uh, properties like uh, layout and so on. I think Mishka is absolutely right. Um, it's all about being able to peel back layers of it and, and punch into the internals. So does anybody here think that framework is a dirty word? I think there's, there's definitely people out there that think that. Uh, all right, we can see like a couple of tentative hands. You don't, you don't have to be shy. You're among <laughs> friends. Well, so, that's spoken by the guy who wrote a library rather than a framework, right? So I don't, I don't even know what framework or library means. Uh, so what I think people don't like are like poorly architected systems that like sometimes are, are branded as frameworks. Um, so I, this is gonna sound like I'm trashing on Rails. I don't think I'm not trying to trash on Rails, but um, but Rails was designed. They they were thinking, okay, um, how do I want the end user like end user as in the developer experience to to be? Okay, I want to define my models like this, and I want to define my views like this, and we're just gonna make that that user interface happen. Um, I think that's the wrong way to design a system because you're always going to want to get beyond that easy to use initial interface and, and punch down into the lower level, right? Like Active Record is going to do a slow query sometime. You're going to want to be able to, to short circuit that. But when you punch down below those internals, there might be some decisions that they made in that public interface that make the internals really nasty. And if you go look at the Rails security vulnerabilities list, you'll see the um, downsides to having that public interface. So what, the approach we took with React is rather than say, okay, we want the out-of-the-box experience with React to look like X, we said, okay, what is the, the fundamental primitive building block that makes sense and is very generalizable? And we said, okay, just a component where we, we give it some data and it always makes sure that the DOM node is up to date. And then, okay, what's the next level of abstraction we can go on top of that? Well, components that are composed of other components. And then, okay, what's the next layer of abstraction that we can go on top of that? And then we said, Components that are stateful, um, that can have state transitions. And then we thought to ourselves, what's the next level of abstraction on top of that? And we couldn't really come up with anything, so we, we shipped that in our open source release, and now the community is starting to build the next layer of abstraction on top of that. So I think if you build um, a framework from the bottom up rather than the top down, um, uh, you'll have a much better experience when you peel back those layers. Okay. So I'm still trying to solicit questions from you guys. Write them down on a piece of paper. Bring them up. Don't be shy. I know it's, it's I have a question. Yeah. What's the difference between a framework and a library? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, from my perspective, the framework is something that calls you, and the library is something that you call. Yes. That's a good one. So the way I like to think about it is who gets to write the main method, right? In a library, you as a developer are fully in charge, mm -hmm. and you call the jQuery whenever you feel like it's uh, and this is very much reversed in the world of the frameworks, where the frameworks own the main method and they will call into you your details of what application is. The funny thing about frameworks and libraries is when you get to the question of dependency injection. And I don't know if lots of people know this, I certainly didn't. And, and speaking from the audience of Java developers, dependency injection is something that you fully support in Angular. Yes. So, but you can't do dependency injection unless someone the thing that's injecting into you is the thing that owns the main method, right? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, Juice is to a large degree a library, right? You, you can call Juice, kind of bootstrap yourself, and it kind of walks the line. Yeah, it, it sort of, it's kind of a gray area. Um, I like to think of frameworks as, um, well, you're, 
your program is a collection of modules, right? And if one module in your system wants to use another piece of code, um, whether that piece of code is a library or framework, I think, <laughs> depends on how, many, how, how the coupling between your modules changes. So um, a good example is if you want to use um, jQuery in one of your modules, that module just uses jQuery to manipulate the DOM, and, you're, and it, it doesn't need to tell any of the other modules that it's using jQuery. Um, if you're using um, something like Backbone, which is actually often touted as a, as a library, not a framework, you end up passing Backbone models around your entire application. So in a lot of ways, this thing that is called a library infects the rest of your application because now all of your domain models are um, dependent on this library rather than, um, are dependent on this library, which one could argue is a framework. So the, the coupling between different pieces of your program changes when you add um, backbone or, or a larger scale framework into your system. So you know, that actually brings me to an interesting point, which is that when you're building a web application, you can pick and choose as many libraries as you want to put in the project, but you typically are restricted to just one framework. Typically frameworks don't really like each other because both don't want to take over the domain that they Frameworks don't compose well with one another. Typically not. Uh, although with Angular, we tried very hard to make it as composable as possible given the constraint that we were still working with. They could have got a different layers, but that, yeah. I mean, Vardin, it's a Vardin framework. And we have been calling that Vardin library, or it was a Millstone library before that. And I, I think it's, it's kind of confusing to kind of speak about libraries and frameworks. So the differences are so subtle that I think the world would be a much better place if we would all agree that there are no frameworks. We are all just libraries over here. So well, that brings up an interesting kind of difference between some of the, the frameworks up here. And of course, this is a smackdown, so we're kind of interested in poking around at the differences. Uh, the modularity works very differently in Java than it does in JavaScript. So the broader question is here, how is the implementation language you're writing these frameworks in, how does it flavor what you can do with the framework and how usable it is and how, how tooling works in that space, et cetera? Discuss. All right, well, I think the, uh, the, the tooling question is something yeah. of a big difference uh, between the, the two stacks that we have up here. And uh, I know when I started trying to look into Angular, they just, you quickly run off into Bower and Grunt and, and, and Yeoman and all these other things that are basically IDE type tools that you do at a command line, whereas in the Java world you have you know, these IDEs that people are more familiar with, with dragging and dropping of components and automatic refactoring and such. Uh, yes, and, and building, right? And, and how modules work. I mean, that, that, that does clearly infect how you structure your whole application. So they're, they're two very different worlds. And so while we're only talking about the web framework piece here, as soon as you buy into any one of our stacks, you really are buying into a big ecosystem of other kinds of things that affect the software development process. I think it's mostly, mostly a question about static and dynamic typing. So if your language happens to have static, static typing that offers a lot of possibilities for tooling, and being on the Java side of the table, uh, I really believe that the static typing is the key for building systems where you have lots of groups of people working on those systems and maintaining those systems and not ending up with a bunch of spaghetti in right. the so end of the project. That comes back to the notion of just knowing where you, what your users are. If your users are banks and uh, you know, corporations and, and they're trying to deliver systems that are just very well defined and they need to last for a good 15, 20 years and they're not going to change. And even more importantly, the people that are using them are paid to be using it, so there's no value add in making it really nice and flashy and good. It's not a competitive advantage for the product you're trying to sell, then that, that gives you a bit more constraint in what you can do, but also makes it easier to develop solutions for them. So typing is a kind of a double-edged sword. Um, I can see both sides. I mean, I, I came from a Java world originally, and I thought the typing was the big piece. Um, then I looked for a while in the JavaScript world where the type disappeared and you had to you kind of taught yourself to rely on tests. And you can definitely see both sides of the world. And uh, there needs to be some happy medium where sometimes types are worth the trouble and sometimes they're not. It reminds me of an old joke, which is that types are exactly what it said a lot of typing. <laughs> well, we tried to experiment with this approach in JSF a long time and it really never quite caught on. But the idea was you could write all of your model objects and even your UI components in a loosely, more loosely typed language like Ruby. And then as you went along in time and understood your design better, you could sort of rewrite the stuff piece by piece in Java and, and have the typing there. But we've had this feature for many, many, many years. 
um, and not very many people have been using it. So that, that's I, um, kind of the conclusion that we came to at Facebook as well. Uh, at least on the server side, Facebook's a very famous PHP shop. Um, for better or mostly worse. Um, but what we discovered is, um, like PHP let us move really fast. We didn't have to, you know, worry about the compiler of like, you know, asserting that every, all of our types, that our type system was consistent. Which is great when you want to gradually approach the solution. You're not sure what you're building, and you just kind of want to, you know, run it, make sure the UI looks good, make sure the interaction feels right. But when you get up to scale, and when you start getting regulated by governments about whether your privacy checks pass or not, um, that's a big deal, and like static typing can help you a lot. So we were able to invest in a new programming language called Hack, which is gradually typed. So you can leave off type annotations, and it'll treat it more like a dynamically typed system. And then you can start adding type annotations, and eventually get to full type coverage. Um, I believe, I don't really know Dart, but doesn't Dart do a little bit of type inference and stuff like that? It is a mixed world where the types are optional. It's a pretty good world. Yeah, it's been successful for us too. And, and TypeScript by, uh, by Microsoft is bringing that to JavaScript as well. We just announced one for JavaScript too. It's a little bit different. So I, I guess my uh, experience is kind of opposite to Misco's. Uh, I come from a dynamic typing world. Uh, I was leading a team like 15 years ago that built pretty big web application with Perl. We had like a couple lines of Perl code and we were super fast in building that. So we hacked it together, and oh my goodness, it's horrible spaghetti. Nobody can maintain that code base. Uh, so that was an inspiration to say, oh my goodness, we have to build better tools for this. So the next try was go to Java world, start to build uh, everything out of Java-based components, but we still built the client side that renders those components in JavaScript. So the server side succeeded, client side was, again, horrible hack. I mean. Uh, it worked pretty well, but none of the users could actually extend that because it was practically impossible to re refactor. It might be that we had just bad coders in our team, but that was the reality for us. Uh, so I, I'm actually quite uh, strongly uh, for Thanks. typing. So I, I think it's, it's really, really good thing that you have strong typing in, in your application. And that if you look language like Scala, you can make it really flexible and nimble even with types. So can we talk about something less controversial, maybe Emacs versus VI? VI. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, Emacs. Emacs. <laughs> uh, it's all about the Eclipse these days, no? No. <laughs> so uh, a couple of questions that, that I got from the audience, actually, and I'm still welcoming more questions, is about uh, particular abilities, and in particular testability. How testable? Was it built as a, an initial goal? How testable uh, are your frameworks now? Well, the, the testability of JSF comes in part from the testability of Java E, and that comes from the, the separation of concerns uh, that was really popularized with dependency injection and being able to use plain old Java objects to control your model system, and therefore that makes mocking very easy. Um, we also had some uh, testability in terms of being able to exercise the UI as well. So when you have components that are just controlling their own little part of the page, you can make assertions about what they should look like and how they should behave, and that's something that we do also well in JSF. So for voting, being on the Java side, of course, uh, everything on the server side is testable by JUnit tests. So that's like quite natural, but I think it's not enough. So in the end of the day, your users see something on the screen, and maybe somebody in your team is at least kind of does something that he shouldn't be doing with the CSS and that breaks IE9 or something like that. So we also have a test tooling on, on the client side called Vardy TestBench based on top Selenium and Terrigan test and our sort of things on both on the DOM level as well as on a pixel by pixel level. And these are packaged as JUnit test as, as well. So this simply is one of my big things. Um, I don't know, some of you might actually heard of me before Angular guy who was running testability um, uh, work at Google, and, and the job we kind of had was to bring uh, testing to developers. So we would join teams for like uh, five, six months, and we would show them you know, how you could refactor testability through the test injection, et cetera. So when it came to, um, to Angular, when I started building Angular, um, testability was very much a um, high priority for me. So there's a lot of different levels of testability. You, you could write your framework in a way that 
you yourself can test it, and there's a whole different aspect of writing a framework so that others are automatically guided towards testable code. Because you could make a framework that uh, you yourself can test the framework, but it doesn't mean that the developers who write against the framework will have an easy time testing it. And this is something that I was kind of hoping that a lot more uh, libraries and frameworks would uh, take to heart, and when they build their frameworks, really thought about assembly from the very beginning. So for example, a lot of decisions we did in Angular are affected by this. Uh, in Angular, we have a controller, and controller is may inject scope, but it's very important that the scope uh, doesn't have a dependency on the UI. So in Angular, you can instantiate the controllers without HTML ever being present. And this is one of the very important points uh, which we wanted to build into Angular so that the testability becomes trivial. Uh, there are no inherent uh, inheritance that you have to do in Angular. Uh, it's all about composition. Uh, those are all properties that, you know, through battle you've discovered that these things are <coughs> indeed the testable stories. So we think, uh, we think Angular's testability is, is really one of its key features that it provides. Now, this is all kind of at a unit testing level, but there's also an end-to-end -end testing level. And when you're building a web application and you click on a button and you want to assert that a particular text is, is shown up, you have this particular problem, which is that you don't know how long to wait before you can read. Uh, and so there's all kinds of strategies people do in terms of waiting and so on. And it gets further complicated because you know the data might be coming from a server and you don't know how long to wait, etc. So not only do we have a beautiful uh, unit testing story, but we also have an end-to-end -end testing story where we have this uh, uh, thing that runs on top of Angular called the protractor. And the protractor's job is to kind of understand how Angular works internally. So when you say, uh, click this button, you can immediately say, and what looks to you as a synchronous um, code, uh, you can say, assert that this particular thing has changed. What it actually does underneath is it builds up a state machine and figures out, okay, there might be a delay between this uh, point over here, it counts how many exit charts go out, it understands how Angular does its rendering cycle, and so it waits until the whole thing is finished before it goes and asserts. And the end result of that is that your tests are a lot less flaky, and they run a lot faster because the checks happen exactly right after you render it. So, yeah, that's really one of my pet peeves that I really love to talk about. Um, so as far as React goes, I, I mentioned that we, we hedge against the back the back end so we can render on the server, um, in the browser, on multiple different UI toolkits, that kind of thing. That actually makes testing components a lot easier because you just call your render method, it returns um, this virtual DOM description of what you want to render. It doesn't actually touch the browser back end at all. So there's no dependency on, on the actual browser DOM. So um, your test execution is pretty quick and it doesn't depend on um, kind of the quirks of this particular browser DOM implementation that you have. Um, with that said, that doesn't cover 100% of testing cases. Like you need these end-to-end -end integration tests like Mishka said. Um, actually, the, the favorite bug that I ever had at Facebook was an intern removed the line of CSS that set the height of all of our images on our mobile site to zero. Um, so the JPEGs were getting served, um, and like everything looked good, but and our tests passed, uh, but we were just getting lots of bug reports, and um, a really, really strong integration testing strategy may have caught that. Um, but there's all sorts of classes of bugs. But one interesting thing that we, um, we did do on the JavaScript side we open sourced um, a JavaScript testing system called Jest. And if you're familiar with Jasmine or RSpec um, or one of those types of um, testing tools, um, sorry, not RSpec, maybe it's RSpec. I don't know the review one. Um, but it's a standard unit testing system for JavaScript, but the key difference is that require, which is JavaScript's version of import, uh, by default returns mocked or auto mocked versions of all of your dependencies, and you explicitly opt out of mock. So normally when you build a system, you, you say, hey, actually I want to mock my user service or my persistent service. With Jest and the way that we write unit tests on the client and Facebook is we have a, um, through the magic of reflection, we import those modules, we generate mocks that look like those public interfaces, and then they um, just return mock representations of everything. So that means out of the box, um, your tests are fast. I'm not necessarily sure that I agree with that because I'm not really sure what you're testing at that point. but. Um, that's you know one of those things that is always being debated internally. So I'm going to uh, avoid asking a question that would terrify the panelist, which is, what's the most glaring weakness of your framework? And instead, <laughs> I'm going to ask a related question. This is an option where you can answer this question if you'd like to. But a more pertinent related question, I think, is, 
Are there particular sweet spots for your framework? Is it better for single page app or enterprise app? And there is a mapping between a framework and a type of application that you may not be building things like Facebook is building, so it may not be suitable for you. So what, what is the really sweet spot for your particular framework? And is there a sweet spot for the kinds of things you're trying to build? Let's not just go down. Let's, let's, let's mix it up. Sure. You know, what I'm saying is I need a little more time. Let's <laughs> <laughs> start with the other end. <laughs> No, I like mixing up. So originally, Angular, the idea for Angular was like, can I um, uh, just simply add some markup into HTML so that a web designer who doesn't necessarily know how to program uh, can uh, make an interactive form? And so I think the strong point of Angular has always been around forms and CRUD, which is you know, create readout page lists, which means you get data from the server, you render it to the user, uh, user somehow interacts with the data, and then you share it, share it back to the server. So the strong points really are, you know, we can get the XHR, we can get it from the browser's memory, we can data bind it from the browser's memory to the UI, uh, the UI, the user can interact with it, and can show it back to the user. That, that would be the, the strong one. For the weak one, I always thought that, you know, things that uh, require uh, very rapid, continuous DOM access, like for example, games, which might not be the appropriate thing for Angular, but since I've been proven wrong on that account many times too, because people seem to also build games in Angular, which always shocks me. Uh, but I wouldn't consider it to be that. You know, Spolsky's rule, which seems to be coming true, that if it can be written in JavaScript, it will be written in JavaScript. That is true. That is true. Yeah. Um, so I obviously have a really big bias here, but I think that we um, that React has stumbled upon a like fundamentally better rendering model than any competing environment. Period. With that said, I don't necessarily think that React is the be-all, end-all of, of creating applications. I think the fundamental ideas of describing your UI as a function at any point in time is a good one. Um, but you can crank out like a simple application in Angular uh, probably quicker than you can in React, and your designers won't want to shoot your engineers in the face if you're using Angular as opposed to the first time they see React code, because it's very oriented towards engineers and, and JavaScript developers rather than people who are more familiar with markup. So um, I think that we excel right now at building really complex um, user interfaces where you have to really get that last 10% of performance or 10% of you know, specific interaction. Like, oh, I want to like, bounce this thing only when I, I pull it 50% of the way or more on the screen or something like that. Um, but I think the fundamental ideas um, should be absorbed into all other UI toolkits that are targeting different use cases. Because I just think that they're really, really good. I'll go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, please. So um, I think what you've got to recognize is that different needs need different kind of frameworks. So if you're going to be building next Facebook, please don't use Bard. I, I, it would be go, going horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, the sweet spot for using Bard is basically those enterprise applications where you are replacing something that those enterprises are running already. And with that, I mean application more you have complexity in your application, more you have user interface in your application, more longer you expect your users to use that application on a daily basis, better it comes for voting. And more you have to kind of uh, rely on a small team to build big application, maintain big application, that's the better and better use case for voting. So if it's for building component-oriented applications, but if you're going to be building uh, like uh, end user facing pretty static website, please use Spring MVC or something like that instead of body. So I already mentioned the, the sweet spot for JSF being the, you know, the enterprise with large teams of corporate developers that have uh, their either junior or mid-level skill sets, not like you know top of the line, uh, really expensive developers, and the junior and middle level, and uh, a clear separation of roles between the people that are writing the code and the people that are designing the UI, uh, and you know those people also they're designing the UI they need to have the right kind of skills that they're not exactly JavaScript experts but they're more kind of page development experts so they are still distinct skill sets they've been coming together over the last few years but I still think a JavaScript developer who designs is different from a designer who also does some JavaScript um, as far as weak spot for JSF I would say um, it's a little it, it can be too easy to build uh, an application that has some memory constraints that doesn't perform as well with memory because things are so convenient to use some of these facilities we have in JSF. 
like you know the session and the, and the view state, um, that it's possible to build poorly performing apps um, without trying too hard. Maybe just going to continue on that. Uh, so you were also mentioning single page applications versus multi page applications. Embodying everything is a single page application. So if you're trying to build a website with many many pages, and I mean like real pages, not just like stage on one sing single page, uh, it wouldn't go too well. But if you're building a single page application, it works right out of the box and it uses push right out of the box, so you don't have to do anything to, to kind of enable that kind of application style. So here's another question from the crowd. How, how well are your frameworks embracing like new standards that are coming about, like for example, web components? Generate a nice rant from some of the people in the panel here. Uh, what, what, you, what do you feel about brand new things are coming on the horizon that are going to have an impact on your ecosystem? So, I remember a long time ago I had a meeting with uh, Dimitri, who is uh, the Google's uh, you know, standards body, and he says, at that point, Angular was just kind of getting going. He says, My job is to make sure that Angular uh, is not needed in the future. <laughs> and so, I like to think that the way I explain it to myself is that Angular has. Uh, influence web components. Um, and I think we, there are some ideas that we have in Angular that has actually made it in. Uh, now the web components are becoming a, a standard, which is also, unfortunately, uh, the roles are kind of reversed, and we have to start being able to consume web components as well. Uh, it's probably too late for uh, Angular 1x to be able to consume web components, but when we have rebuilt Angular on top of Dart, uh, we wanted to make sure that we are uh, running on top of web components so we can, for example, consume Shadow DOM already and take uh, a lot of use of it in Angular Dart. And now all these learnings that we have gotten from are we're funneling it back into Angular 2.0. And in 2.0, uh, the goal is to be able to use any web component uh, and all the data binding should be indistinguishable whether you are data binding to an existing Angular component or you data binding to a web component on, uh, underneath. And, uh, also wanted to make sure that Angular can export itself as a web component, so not only consume it, but also export them. So going forward, uh, we very much like to embrace the, the future of the web uh, and consume it. Well, web, web components is just one part of it. There's so many other specs like you know, web socket, service and events, uh, Canvas, and, and when you have this UI component abstraction model that we have with JSF, you're able to, for example, take advantage of Canvas. If you want to have a JSF component that's using the Java, not the Java 2D, the uh, Canvas 2D drawing object, you can go ahead and do that. Um, the WebSocket and the JSON and the other kinds of things that are doing there, that's just a part of what we have in Java EE. So by building on top of Java EE, we're taking, letting you take advantage of that in your apps. Um, and that's not specific to JSF, that's just Java EE. Before I start ranting about web components, um, uh, ES6 is the upcoming version of, of JavaScript, and it's been coming like real soon now for the past couple of years. But um, there's a lot of tools out there um, called ES6 Transpiler. Google has one called Tracer. Um, did I pronounce that right? I, I have no idea. I don't know. I always struggle. I, I looked at you like you have ever answered everything Google. Um, <laughs> uh, we have one called JS Transform. Um, and they basically let you use like traditional classes rather than having to figure out like what the stupid prototype thing is. Um, you can do generators in the upcoming ES6. Uh, what else is in there? Um, Destructuring assignment, arrow functions, just like a lot of nice syntax borrowed from CopyScript. It's, it's kind of like what Groovy did for Java, except um, there's very little semantic changes. It's just kind of a more concise way to do some things. Um, but I'm not really excited about. Uh, so we're all really excited about ES6. I think I know that Angular is using it. I know Ember is using it. React is using it. Pretty much everybody's using it because it's a big win. Uh, web components, I feel, are either, they're solving one great problem, I think, which is being able to customize the native form fields. So if you want to change the way a select dropdown behaves, like that form component in the browser, you have to re-implement the entire thing in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And Facebook did it, and it's like 4,000 lines of code. And that means getting accessibility right, making sure it works on all these different platforms. And now that like mobile is a thing, we have to rethink all that, too. Um, so Shadow DOM, which is one of the family of specifications under the Web Components umbrella, lets us customize that. And I think that is really, really great. Um, so we can finally throw out all that code and customize what a select looks like. That's amazing. Um, but they're also, the goal is to basically kill off um, the need for JavaScript frameworks and build a better application development environment in the browser. And I think that's a really dangerous idea for a number of reasons. 
Number one, um, it continues to tie us to the DOM and the web um, family of technologies, which again, we're designed for documents. And we're starting to evolve it um, away from there. Um, but evolution only gets us so far. I think we have to throw out a lot of this stuff and start from scratch. If you were to build a UI toolkit, it would look nothing like the DOM. Um, the second thing is like we're not necessarily, you don't have all the answers yet um, to, build, to the right way to build in the browser. Um, they're basically baking in best practices um, of 2009, and um, React likes to think that we've found some new best practices that shouldn't necessarily be baked into a standard that we have to live with forever. And the final thing is just kind of philosophically, um, baking an application development toolkit, like a, a, the SDK that end users are supposed to use, um, into a browser that's distributed to billions of people that has to be, every time you want to make a change to it, you have to go, like, go through a standards, standardization process that takes forever. Do you think that's ever going to lead to an SDK that can let us build cutting edge applications? Or do you think the Apples and Googles of the world that control the Android and iOS platforms can roll out frosted glass in a year? Um, we, are people even thinking about a standard for frosted glass on the web? I don't know, but it's really hard to build that effect if you want to look like a native application on iOS. So, but I was going to say that uh, I think it's, it's an interesting point of view. Uh, I, I actually haven't seen that. What I've seen more in the, in the only standards is how to build primitives, uh, such as uh, object observe or shadow DOM. And these are primitives that are, um, first of all, much easier to, to, to standardize, and also they're more useful into a lot of different things. So as far as building primitives, I think you would agree that primitives are probably a good idea. As far as building frameworks, I totally agree with you that uh, that is certainly not what the, the platform should do because frameworks can be evolved much faster without standards, and I don't think anybody's trying to do that. Um, I think there might be some maybe confusion because people may think in the same way, but uh, I, I don't feel like the web standards are trying to <laughs> take over the framework world. I think really they are just providing primitives that could be consumed by others uh, to build so, if I may continue on this, it looks like we are almost running out of time. So basically, um, what is a component-based framework? And it, it basically promises to you that it makes a web application development easy. And now there is this upcoming standard, web component standard, that has the exact same promise. Of course, different language, so it's not the same thing. But that kind of sets these two things to be on a collision course, right? except that you cannot use web components today. Your users don't have browsers today. I mean, all of the users that could use and consume those web components. So we have a bit of time. And I think when your users can use those web components, Bodin is pretty much merged with the, and aligned with that standard. I mean, we will be able to produce web components, consume web components, or actually you can consume web components in Bodin already today. But when you can start using those components, uh, you can program with boring components and assume that these are web components, actually. Okay. I think we are now officially out of time, so join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you